So, so far we've talked about some basic terms in economics, like what is economics, what's scarcity, and we talked about types of economies and the factors of production. In this video, we're going to dive into types of businesses and types of competition. Now, we'll start with the types of businesses and then we'll look at some micro indicators. This is just um, a fancy way of saying, remember micro is like study on a small scale. What are some indicators, some statistics and numbers that individual businesses will look at to determine what they should produce or how much they should produce or for who they should produce it for. Um, and then we'll wrap up by talking about the different types of competition. So first, when we talk about types of businesses, I need you to know that there are for-profit businesses and there are Nonprofit businesses. Nonprofit businesses just mean they are operating usually with some kind of mission to provide a good or service to the community for a very low cost um, or for some particular reason. They might charge for their goods and services. However, that money is being reinvested back into the business and it's not about making a profit. Generally speaking, we're going to be talking about for profit businesses. So let's start with sole proprietorship, partnerships, and corporations. A sole proprietorship is a business that is owned and operated by one person. There is one owner. We see this a lot, actually. In fact, this is one of the most common types of businesses there is in the United States. Think of all the different entrepreneurs that start a business, like, you know, Johnny's Lawn Care, or, you know, um, Susie's Car Wash, or, um, a babysitter, okay? These are sole proprietors, people who own their own business. We see this with bakeries, like small town bakeries, or a lawn care or car wash service. And there are a lot of advantages to having a sole proprietorship. For example, whoever the owner is has the pride in knowing that they took the risk and they are working to make a name for themselves and their business. And because of that, they get to keep all the profit that they make. Also, this is great for decision making because you don't have to consult with anyone else. You are the owner and you get to make the decision. With a sole proprietorship, there's also a lot of flexibility. You work for yourself and so you get to choose when to work, where to work, how much to work. And there are tax breaks for this. Lots of There's lots of encouragement for people to start a business. Now, there are disadvantages. If you're the only owner, you are financially responsible for this all by yourself. And if someone sues you, you're responsible for it. There's unlimited liability. And it can be very hard to raise the funds to start a business. Starting a business has a lot of cost. You might hear of startup cost, and it costs a lot of money oftentimes to start up a business. Think about it. If you're starting a lawn care business, you're going to need a lawnmower, and you're probably going to need some kind of marketing, like signs or maybe a website or, you know, brochures or flyers to hand out or business cards. So you have to raise the funds in order to get started. Um, and if you can't find someone who fits your team as an employee or is qualified, you're going to have to pick up the slack. You're in the end responsible for it. So sole proprietorship is hard work because you and only you are responsible for the business su success or failure. Okay, I just thought it would be fun to point out some examples of companies that started out as a sole proprietorship. For example, McDonald's a guy named Ray Kroc mortgaged his home in order to take up take over a fast food restaurant and began McDonald's. And look how far it's come. Sam Walton is another example of a sole proprietor or entrepreneur that purchased Ben Franklin's store and later it grew into Walmart. Think about James Cash Penny, J.C. Penny, if you're familiar with that, department store. And he bought out his partner in 1912 and became a sole proprietor of his store. So many corporations started out as a sole proprietorship. Okay, less than 20% of small business employers are millionaires. So going back to that advantages and disadvantages, many people want to start their own business and get rich. But I just want to point out that less than 20% of small business employers or owners are millionaires. It's hard work to start a small business. And sure, there are absolutely very successful small business owners that's become very wealthy, but generally speaking, not the case. 
All right, so we have sole proprietorship. A partnership is just what you probably think. It's when there are two or more owners, okay? So you're not in it by yourself. You have someone in it. We see this a lot with like dentists, Michaels and Gates. Gakewe, for example, in town, or lawyers, Taft, Taft, and Hagler, um, Hardy and Hardy, Ben and Jerry started out as a partnership. And so there are advantages to this. If you think back to the disadvantages of a sole proprietorship, there's advantages in that with two or more people, it's a lot easier to raise money because you can combine your income and combine your um, investment together. There are still tax breaks, just like in a sole proprietorship. And you can partner with someone who has special talents. So say you're really great at marketing and your buddy's really great at clothing design. He does the clothing design and you do the marketing and together y'all go into business. So you can highlight each other's talents and assets and use each other's skills to be more successful. Now, there are disadvantages. Under a sole proprietorship, you're the only one to consult if you need to make a decision. But in a partnership, you and your partner or partners have to work together to make the decisions. And if it's a 50-50 split, it might be hard sometimes to make a decision. Maybe you want to purchase something new, new equipment, something fancier, stronger, and more powerful, but your partner doesn't. How is that going to work out? You'll have to decide and think through that. There's still liability issues, so you're still responsible if you're sued, Um, and you're still responsible even though you have someone to share that burden with. The two or three of y'all are still responsible for the finances, and that's a lot of pressure. Okay, so our last one, and one that most of the time when people think, oh, I want to have a business, they're thinking like big corporation business. And as we've already said, most businesses are actually sole proprietorships, but corporations own the largest part of the wealth of businesses. So a corporation is when many individuals together own stock in a company and it's treated as, as its own entity. It's almost like its own person, right? But it is open to anyone who can purchase stock, well, you might have it limited to certain individuals who can purchase stock, but if it's a public corporation, anyone can invest in the company and have say in its ownership. So we see this like McDonald's. It started out as a sole proprietorship and Walmart, same too. And it eventually became a corporation or big businesses like Procter & Gamble produces things like Tide. There are advantages to this, certainly. If other people can invest in your business and take part as owners, then it's a lot easier to raise money. And you can have professionals, business professionals and executives run the business, like a board of directors runs the business, but many people can invest in the business. So like you might have stock, you buy stock in the stock market, you might buy stock in Procter & Gamble. You are an owner of Procter & Gamble. That means that you get to vote on who's on the board and the board will run and make the day-to-day business decisions. Ownership can be easily transferred. If I want to sell my shares in the company, I just simply sell my stock. Um, And there is limited liability. If you are an owner of a corporation, if you're a stockholder, and the company is sued, you aren't being sued. The company is being sued, which is a little different than a sole proprietorship. If you're the owner and it's not incorporated, then you're the one responsible for the liabilities. And that includes debt. Now, the disadvantages are... is are plenty. In a corporation, it is very expensive to become a corporation. The legal fees are very high um, and it's also very complex. You would need attorneys to help walk you through the documents and the charters and all the things needed to define the corporation. And the owners as stockholders have little say. Now, the owners are making profit. Okay, That profit that the company makes is divvied out to the owners, the stockholders. But they don't have say, like no one at Procter & Gamble is asking me as a stockholder what we should charge for Tide. That is not even an option. They do not care about what my opinions are on that matter. So owners as a stockholder have little say in that. The board of directors and executives are going to make those decisions. Um, there are more government regulations for obvious reasons in a corporation because there's a lot more money, people's money in, at stake here. 
Um, and oftentimes we say this is double tax. This means that the owners are making um, money from the company and they are paying tax on those earnings. But the business, the corporation, is also paying tax on its profits. So sometimes people will say that corporations can be double taxed, depending on what kind of corporation it is, meaning that people who are earning money are paying taxes and the company itself is paying taxes on its profit. All right, so these are the types of businesses. Let's look at some micro indicators that business use businesses use to determine where to produce their goods or how much to produce and how much to price their goods for or services for. So um, remember micro means small, like individual decisions. And an indicator is just like, this indicates that we should do this, or this indicates that this isn't a good area for us to go to. So indicators kind of guide us in our decision making. They're facts, numbers, um, statistics that help us to make decisions for our businesses. So here are some um, examples. This is not an all-inclusive list, but here are some examples of things that business owners consider. Remember, microeconomics is study of individuals and individual businesses making decisions. So what are some statistics and numbers and facts? Facts that individual businesses use to determine where they should or shouldn't produce their goods and services. So one is a number of producers. So um, fancy way of saying this is like, what is the saturation of this um, area? Okay, is there are there a lot of producers in this area? Are there will I have a lot of competition in this area? Or you know, is there no one? Um, in this area that's producing anything um, similar to my goods. That might be a good area for you to go into. Um, if you're, you know, producing something that there's like 16 of already competing, like, okay, a while back in Greenville, there was like a whole bunch of mattress stores opening at one time. Now, if you wanted to open up your own business and sell mattresses, and you were to look in Greenville, you've probably would have said, whoa, this market is very saturated with lots of producers selling mattresses. Perhaps I shall not sell my mattresses here. I shall go to a nearby county or area to sell mattresses where there aren't as many producers in this area. Also, number of products. Is there one producer that's just like slamming the um, market with tons of products already? Maybe that's not a good place for you. Um, or it could be, how many products can you produce? Um, will you be able to produce enough for the demand in this area or not? Um, consumer traits. So if you are marketing, um, let's say if you're marketing like really bougie watches, watches um, like think like Rolex, you know, maybe you shouldn't go to an area who has very low um, income rates. So if you're going, you wouldn't go to a county with like, that's been poverty stricken and try to sell fancy watches. You probably won't have a great market for that. Um, but maybe you would go to an area like the Triangle where there's a much higher level of income per capita. And that would be a good place to try to sell, you know, your bougie watch. Okay. Another thing is elasticity. So when we talk about demand and supply, we'll talk about elasticity. But how much does the demand or supply change depending on the price? Okay, so that's another. So if you're trying to set a price for your good and you know that the demand for it is super elastic, that means the higher you increase your price, the less likely people are to buy it. Okay, and we're going to talk about elasticity a lot more in depth when we get to supply and demand. So just kind of put an asterisk by that and say, see supply and demand notes for elasticity. But that is an indicator that businesses are gonna look at. Also resource allocation, you know, are you gonna be able to get the supplies you need for your business um, in the area that you are choosing to work in? Also diminishing returns and supply um, for each um, item you have, you know, are you going to, like, if you think about, like, what is the cost of producing an item? If you're only producing one, the cost per item is going to be pretty high. But if you're producing a mass, that drives down the cost per item. So that's something you might consider as well as a micro indicator. 
talked about types of businesses and we talked about some indicators businesses might use to make decisions. Now let's talk about types of competition. There are a couple con kinds of competition that we're going to talk about. We've got monopolistic for first, oligopolies and monopolies. So a monopolistic type of competition is also called like market or pure competition. And this is when there are a whole bunch of companies that sell the similar sell similar products or services, and they all are competing with each other. Not one of these companies has total control. So you might have many brands selling the same thing. You know, there's a little price difference between products. I mean, here and there, there might be a little bit, but generally speaking, you know, you don't have one company charging $5 and another company charging $500 for similar products. They're very similar in pricing. Um, there is um, not a whole lot of a barrier um, for new businesses to come into the industry. So think about like clothing companies, that would be like a monopolistic type of competition. If you wanted to start a business selling clothes, you could easily do that. That is because the clothing industry has many companies um, that are selling similar products when all is said and done. Um, producers do have a degree of control over the price. Um, and like I said, this would be like clothes or potato chips, um, toothpaste. There's a whole bunch of different brands of toothpaste on the market. Um, in our earlier video on market economy, we talked about how many different brands of toilet paper there were. And um, that is a great example of monopolistic or market competition. Many companies competing with very similar products and no company really has more like that much more control than other companies and the price is generally pretty similar between the different companies. Then we have what is called an oligopoly. An oligopoly is when there are just a handful of companies that are competing and they have very similar products. So just a few companies competing in an industry is called an oligopoly. Say it with me, oligopoly. That's really fun to say. That's when one company would have a huge impact on the market. A great example of this would be Coke and Pepsi. So Coke and Pepsi are both soft drink producers. They both sell very similar products. You've got like Mountain Dew and, um, oh, I just lost the name of it. Mellow Yellow compete. I mean, for every kind of Coke product, there is a similar Pepsi product. And if Pepsi goes and ups its price to $2 for a bottle in the drink machine, then Coke would also have to do the same thing or would do the same thing to increase its profits. Um, we see this with movie producers. There's not a whole lot of movie producers in the United States. Video game producers, cell phone companies, think about US Cellular, Verizon. You know, there's not a whole lot of choices. If you want to have a cell phone um, provider, you have just a handful of choices. Um, soft drinks, like we've mentioned. Now, you might hear a word thrown around, thrown around when we talk about oligopolies called collusion. That means the two companies are working together and say, hey, if you up your price, I'll up mine and we'll both benefit from it. Or, hey, we're going to use uh, this product to make it a little cheaper. If y'all do that too, the quality of both our products might go down a little bit, but we'll make more money off of it. And both of them kind of agree to it. So generally speaking, we think of collusion as the companies working together in order to increase both their profits. So it benefits Pepsi to increase its prices and Coke's in on it too. So it also increases its price. And since there's not really any other option, if you want Coke or Pepsi, you just have to deal with it. So that's called collusion. Now, in the United States, we see several of these. We see monopolistic competition, we see oligopoly, and monopolies are a little different in the United States. So a monopoly is when one company controls everything in the market. If you've ever played the game Monopoly before, the board game, you know the way to win the game is to own the most property. The person who owns the most property is going to eventually drain the wallets of everyone else playing. So once you own the most property, you will win the game. That's a monopoly. You'll have a monopoly on the property of the board game. So monopolies in the United States are illegal unless they are government owned. Um, so for example, Coke and Pepsi can't go in together and create one business called 
Coke or Pepsi and then charge whatever they want for one for a soft drink. That is illegal in the United States because it does not benefit the consumers. Um, The businesses would be able to take advantage of the consumers, and the government doesn't want that. We see this through antitrust laws. Antitrust is when the government goes in and breaks up monopolies to prevent them from taking advantage of consumers. However, if the government owns a monopoly, then it's allowed. And you might be asking, well, why does the government get to do this? Well, the government's going to step in and do this for services or products that benefit the public for only one person on. So, like, utility companies are generally owned by the government or slightly owned through some kind of um, agreement because you have to go in and put like run electricity and water pipes and drains and wastewater. You've got to go in and run infrastructure. And it doesn't make sense for multiple companies to go in and run infrastructure through multiple in one town. It just doesn't make sense to have multiple places to get utilities within the town of Greenville, because that means we're going to have one company is going to run electrical lines and then company B is going to go in and run additional electrical lines because they're not going to be allowed to use company A's. And that would not, we don't need that much infrastructure that would cause problems. So it is beneficial for there to be one business that is running that service or product. And because we don't want one person to take it, one business to take advantage of consumers, the government steps in. Um, We do see monopolies in other places like De Beers Diamonds. Um, There's a lot of conversation about um, current potential monopolies in the United States, like Apple. Is it a monopoly? Is it not? Uh, Google. Is Google a monopoly or is it not? Facebook has bought up Instagram and other social media platforms. Is it a monopoly? So a lot of our tech industries right now are under scrutiny for potentially being monopolies and taking advantage of consumers um, or having information that its competitors cannot get. Um, And so therefore, there is some... um, potential for some deeper regulation of tech companies. We saw this in the past when you look at American history, places like AT&T or Standard Oil. Standard Oil is broken up and like think about the business tycoons um, during the period of industrialization and how the progressive era we see the breaking up of the antitrust or, or we see the breaking up of trust through antitrust laws like Sherman Antitrust Law. Okay, so these are the different types of competition. Monopolistic, meaning there's many businesses that are selling the same thing for generally the same price. It's easy to open up a business in that market. Um, Oligopolies, which is when there's just a handful of businesses competing that are selling the same good or a similar good, like Coke and Pepsi. Um, And the monopoly is just one business owns the entire industry and is the only place um, to get a product or a service, which in the United States is not allowed unless it's government um, owned or regulated heavily. 